being activated. We saw openings uh, in the north, which was critical because aid to North Gaza was particularly deficient. That's improved. But now we've seen, unfortunately, the reverse. Because of the uh, actions in and around uh, Rafah, we see the critical transit points in the south, Rafah Gate itself, as well as Karem Shalom, uh, until recently being um, uh, stopped or, uh, or disrupted, uh, so that the situation in the south now risks being uh, even more egregious. But uh, the restrictions that have been in place, um, in some cases, it's uh, because of concerns about uh, dual-use items and making sure that uh, Israel could see and verify what was going in, given the history of, of dual-use. In some instances, it's because of the um, war conditions that make it incredibly difficult. But there are also things that Israel can, should, and must do to further facilitate the distribution of aid, including much more effective deconfliction with those who are providing it. So convoys that are bringing the aid in can go about their work safely and securely. That remains insufficient. Senator Paul. Secretary Blinken, on your recent trip to China, news reports came back and said that you reserved your strongest language for uh, China and its dealings with Russia, castigating Beijing for allowing the war to continue in Ukraine. The report went on to describe the exchange as such a blatant dressing down in the Chinese capital. Do you think publicly scolding China will make it more or less likely that they continue selling dual-use parts to, to, to Russia? Um, Senator, we've, we've tried it both ways. Uh, we've had these conversations with China from some time in private, hoping to see a change. Uh, yeah. We haven't seen that, and it's important. I would argue that really, I would argue that we've only tried it one way. We've got the stick and almost the majority of uh, people who work for you, everybody wants to use a stick. Nobody's really considering that there is a carrot. So really for the last, let's say, f five years or more, your administration, the previous administration, not a lot different, really, that uh, you put impediments to trade, you add sanctions, and then you scold them. And I mean, there is a school of philosophy or a school of diplomacy that, that believes that public scolding, particularly in another country, can have the opposite effects, that actually you've either completely given up on this, nothing's working, so why don't we just read them the Riot Act? And that's kind of what it looked like. Yellen was also there recently, and she's described and told uh, the Chinese government how it should run its economy, what sectors of its economy that they should or should not subsidize, and uh, hold, told them as well who, who they can conduct business with. And then she threatened to impose sanctions, you know, more or less likely to actually get them to do. I mean, I think it's a misunderstanding of diplomacy in general to think that you going and scolding the Chinese, Yellen going and scolding the Chinese, that somehow they're going to let go, oh my goodness, we've been wrong all along, and because they've yelled at us and treated us like school children, we're now going to change. I would think that the opposite might be true, that there might be a certain amount of child psychology to criticizing people, and that like a rebellious teenager, they actually might end up doing more. In addition to the threat of sanctions, in addition to the scolding, we now have the administration talking about uh, more tariffs. So in June of 2019, then-presidential candidate Joe Biden tweeted, Trump doesn't get the basics. He thinks his tariffs are being paid for by China. Any freshman econ student would tell you that the American people are paying his tariffs. Remarkably accurate and true at that time, but now he's become uh, jumping on the Trump train. But the thing about tariffs, regardless of who pays them, American consumers will pay for these. Tariffs are not good for the economic well-being of all Americans in general. But the question would become, when you add tariffs, so you're going to threaten sanctions, you're going to scold them, now you're going to add tariffs. More or less likely that they'll do what you want. I think less likely. Everything we're doing, everything the previous administration did, as well as this administration, is heading towards less tradement, disengagement from China. Part of diplomacy might be offering, well, I tell you what, what if you quit selling the dual-use parts to Russia? Maybe we could consider removing some sanctions on trade and actually trade more with you. So the threat of sanctions, the threat of tariffs, actually have some effects if you're willing to remove them. The history of sanctions is more, 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 and then you're not doing enough, and people on the right here will say, you've got to do even more, we're going to pass legislative sanctions. Nobody talks about removing them. But that's the only way you'd get behavior to change. And so I really think that it's a fundamental misunderstanding sort of of what's going on. The final point I would like to make, and I'll let you respond to this, is the Ukrainians still claim that victory 
includes the reclamation of all of its territory. Many NATO allies are beginning to question this. Czech President Peter Pavel, who once served as the chairman of NATO's military committee, recently stated that he believes it's naive to think that Ukraine will be able to regain the occupied territories from Russia. The commander in general of the Ukrainian army, until he was fired by Zelensky, had the same sort of comments. I think that it's not an unreasonable thing to believe that this may, war may well end in stalemate with people in place. Some say similar to the way Korea was. Nobody likes it. Nobody wanted it. Nobody agrees the Russians should be there. But they're there, and they have a bigger army and more might than their neighbor. So if President Pavel is correct in his assessment that Ukraine's war aims are naive, one of the few negotiating items Ukraine possesses is a promise to remain a neutral country, not aligned militarily, yet you have repeatedly ruled out Ukraine remaining outside of NATO. If you take this off the table, you're taking off one of the things that actually is a negotiating item. My question to you is, are there any circumstances under which neutrality of Ukraine would be a negotiating item? Thank you, Senator. Uh, let me try to respond to both, uh, both questions. Uh, first, if you want to look at, uh, at, at hectoring or haranguing, uh, I would invite you to look at the website of the Chinese uh, Foreign Ministry on a daily basis uh, in terms of what they say about us. Second, uh, I'm not going to apologize to anyone for standing up for American workers and American companies because here's what we're dealing with. Um, and by the way, of course, you're right, we always try. Uh, and as a diplomat, I always try to engage our partners or adversaries diplomatically, quietly, to see if we can get the result. If we don't, then we have to use every means at our disposal, including yet calling them out. Let me, if I may, please sanctions. address the question. So on this, what we've seen and what we're seeing now, uh, and this goes to the tariff question, is China very deliberately uh, using overcapacity in critical sectors to export its way out of its current economic troubles and to do that uh, in a way that undercuts and indeed could all, gut our all own of that workers is and true, industries. But my question to you is, is there an offer ever that you would undo things of in course. exchange for behavior? Of course, and that goes So with, you want to argue course. tariffs are good and sanctions are good. Yeah. The offer would have to be to say to the government, quietly or otherwise, that we would be willing to go in the opposite direction. Of course. There's no public, I hear no public discussion, not from Congress and not from anyone in the administration. Senator, the, We the, would undo this if this. Senator, so, on, their, on, their own, on their own terms, uh, it's clear that if the conduct that we object to and that risks terrible damage to our workers, to our communities, to our companies, if they change that conduct, of course. Did you uh, specifically no discuss not having tariffs or undoing sanctions in exchange for the Chinese to quit selling dual-use parts to Russia? Um, in the context, sure, if, they, if their companies uh, don't engage in that practice, we're not going to sanction them. I didn't hear any public statements of that. Did you make private statements to President Xi that you would undo trade sanctions and not put on tariffs in exchange for better behavior by, towards Russia? By, by definition, if they don't engage in the conduct that we uh, object to, then we're not going to be uh, using those tariffs or using those sanctions. But this but sounds like me drawing this out of you doesn't sound to me like this is the kind of diplomacy that's occurring. If you want it to occur, you have to have a little different conception of you've got the stick. The whole problem with diplomacy in this country, not just your administration, but the previous is all you see is the stick, all you see is more sanctions. And if I ask you to tell me what has China done to change its behavior based on your sanctions, to change their behavior for the better, I would say you can't come up with anything China's doing. Everything seems to be the wrong direction. That's your interpretation. Everything's the wrong direction. But we've actually so the seen sanctions really are not having a value unless you want to negotiate removing sanctions to get better behavior. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I welcome, Mr. Secretary. And I want to start by applauding you and the President uh, for your overall approach to foreign policy and national security. You've helped strengthen our alliances, stood up to Putin's aggression, and confronted the challenges posed by China. And the President was right, absolutely right, to travel to Israel in the immediate aftermath of the horrific Hamas terror attacks of October 7th to express our solidarity in word and in deed. But like you, uh, I've been very concerned with the way the Netanyahu government has conducted the war in Gaza. We understand the desp despicable tactics of Hamas, but we also understand that there's a responsibility uh, to make sure that a just war is fought justly. 
And I've been especially uh, concerned about the restrictions placed on the delivery of humanitarian assistance to two million Palestinians who have nothing to do with Hamas. It only leads to unnecessary human suffering. And as you and Secretary Austin have pointed out, it also undermines our overall strategic objectives and those of Israel. And it also means that on top of everything else, Americans have spent over $300 million to build a temporary pier in Gaza to try to prevent more people from starving. That's the right thing to do, but we had to do it because we couldn't get the Netanyahu government to get more food and other aid through the many land crossings and get it delivered to people safely without over 200 aid workers getting killed, including those killed in the attack on the World Central Kitchen. That's why virtually every international aid organization that has operated worldwide for decades say they've never experienced a worse man-made humanitarian disaster than that in Gaza. That's why the president said at one point, no excuses. And yet in the recent National Security Memorandum 20 report, the administration cannot even bring itself to conclude what is painfully obvious to anybody paying attention that for long periods of time, between October 7th and today, the Netanyahu government has failed to comply with the international norms that require it to facilitate and not arbitrarily restrict or deny the delivery of humanitarian assistance to people in desperate need. Mr. Secretary, that hurts our credibility around the world, and it sets a dangerously low bar for what's acceptable going forward. I listened to your exchange with Senator Merkley regarding the use of U.S. weapons. This issue does not require additional investigation. We've seen this play out in real time. And while you concluded in a snapshot that Israel had improved and was doing better, the report required a backwards look. And the administration decided to duck that. You and I have known each other for a long time. I have tremendous respect for you. But I thought that was important to say. I, I know you and the president are trying 24-7 to bring an end to this conflict. I know you're working 24-7 to bring back all the hostages and make sure that there are no more October 7ths. But as the president and you and others have pointed out, in order to achieve a durable end to the conflict, we need to build a future that has security and dignity and hope for Israelis and Palestinians alike. That is why the president has tried to create some light at the end of this very dark tunnel, by calling for recognition of Israel by Saudi Arabia and others, paired with a clear timeline for the establishment of a viable Palestinian state. I listened to your, your discussion with Senator Murphy. Um, I've lost count, Mr. Secretary, of exactly how many how many times you've actually traveled to Israel and the region? My staff tells me it's about seven. Is that right? So you, the National Security Advisor, Secretary of Defense, two aircraft carrier deployments, billions of dollars in military assistance, hundreds of millions to build a pier. Our work, our very important work to intercept the Iranian missiles launched um, at Israel. So would you agree that it's in our national security interests to have a plan in place to achieve a two-state solution within a clearly defined period of time paired with normalization of relations with countries like Saudi Arabia? Yes, I would. And I want to raise this because, you know, for a long time the U.S. policy has been in favor of two-state solution. I mean, formally announced during George W. Bush's administration, so over two decades. And despite the fact that we say those words, we have never addressed our policy uh, to use our influence to make it happen. You would agree, would you not, that the continued expansion of illegal settlements and outposts in the West Bank makes it harder to achieve a two-state solution? I would. And yet, if you look at Prime Minister Netanyahu's extremist government, that as you know includes people like Smotrich and Ben Gavir, since they came into power, and while the war in Gaza has been raging, we've witnessed the largest land seizures in the West Bank in decades. In fact, during your visit in March, 
Finance Minister Smotrich, who also has a West Bank portfolio under the Minister of Defense, announced the single largest West Bank land grab. And the question is, what are we, what are we going to do if it conflicts with our national security interests to try to achieve a two-state solution? I applaud the actions taken with respect to individual extremist settlers, but they are just part of a movement largely empowered by this current government. I don't know if you had a chance, Mr. Secretary, to read the New York Times Magazine this weekend, Israel's extremist takeover by two veteran journalists, including an Israeli investigative reporter. I urge you to look at it. So my, my question is, if we agree about our national security interests, what are we going to do to make sure that we achieve the goal, not only of normalization, I heard the conversation, but that, as you said, has to be paired with a, mm -hmm. a Palestinian state and timeline. What is the plan to get there in, with a, a, a timeline that, that became president? He inherited peace and prosperity in the world. We now have two simultaneous wars waging, the worst war in Europe since World War II and the worst war in the Middle East in 50 years. Both, I believe, were caused by this administration's consistent weakness. And indeed, your foreign policy is precisely backwards from what a rational American foreign policy should be. To our friends and allies, this administration has consistently undermined, weakened, and attacked them. And to our enemies, this administration has shown constant appeasement and indeed has flowed billions of dollars to the enemies of America who want to kill us. Senator Barrasso asked you about Ibram Raisi. Your State Department put out a statement sending condolences for his death. Mr. Secretary, is the world better today now that Raisi is dead? Given the horrible acts that he engaged in both as a judge uh, and as president, uh, to the extent he can no longer engage in them, yes, the Iranian people are probably better off. You, you didn't say that in your statement, did you? Uh, I, I believe that, uh, that we did. And certainly our to, spokesperson... Today, the United Nations is flying their fl flag at half-staff to mourn the death. Would you agree that it is utterly disgraceful for the United Nations to be mourning the death of the butcher of Tehran? Uh, we're certainly not mourning his death, as I said. We Would you agree it's disgraceful for the UN to be? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll look at what they've done. We certainly would not do that. But what they've done is flown the flag at half-staff. Is well, that disgraceful? We, we wouldn't do that, and we would certainly find that. And, and I would note that's the absence of American leadership. All right, let's shift. The Washington Post on May 11th wrote an article. I'm going to read the opening paragraph. The Biden administration working urgently to stave off a full-scale Israeli invasion of Rafah is offering Israel valuable assistance in an effort to persuade it to hold back, including sensitive intelligence to help the Israeli military pinpoint the location of Hamas leaders and find the group's hidden tunnels, according to four people familiar with the U.S. offers. Is that paragraph accurate? Uh, exactly the opposite. First of all, no one has done more to defend Israel than Joe Biden. Is that paragraph uh, no, accurate? No, let me finish, if I may, please. He was there right after. I, I'm October not interested 7th. in a campaign speech. I'm, I, I have limited time. Is the paragraph in the Washington Post accurate? Uh, as you read it, no. Uh, to the contrary, we're providing everything we possibly can to Israel to help them find. So the four sources them. that briefed the Post, and by the way, briefed uh, multiple other media outlets, they were lying? Uh, absolutely. So, this, all right, so that, does the administration, did the administration offer to provide the locations of senior Hamas leaders to Israel if they didn't invade Rafah? Uh, that's, t again, totally, uh, totally misleading and wrong. Here's what we've said. And here's, what, and here's what we're doing. We have said that there is a better way to deal with the challenge that... I, I'm not interested in the speech. If you don't want to Did hear my answer. Did you offer the location of senior Hamas officials if, we if they uh, didn't invade Rafah? No, That's a we, yes or no. If we, no. If we had the locations, of course we'd provide them, irrespective. So, so this statement, you're saying the Post got it totally wrong, it is utterly false, and, and anyone who said to the contrary was lying and perjuring themselves that, if they that, were under oath. That statement is incorrect. We have done and will continue to do everything we can to, if we can do it, develop the information and share the information. Uh, I wish we had it. Does the administration have intelligence on the locations of Hamas officials that you have not shared with Israel? Uh, no. Does the administration have the locations of Hamas terror tunnels that you have not shared with Israel? No. 
Okay, so then your, your position is that this story is an utter and complete lie. As, as, you've, as you've read it to me, Senator, it's not, it, it, it is not, it is not and, accurate. And, and, not and we're not interested facts. in playing word games. I've asked no. you very directly. I have so not. So you're saying there's not a single Hamas leader that you know about that you, that you or the administration has offered will tell you where they are if you don't engage, invade Rafah. That is correct. Rafa. What have you offered them not to invade Rafah? We've offered them nothing, nothing not to invade Rafah except a plan to deal more effectively with Rafah. Okay, so your testimony under Rafa. oath is you've offered them nothing not to invade Rafah. I find that very hard to believe, but I just want to understand what your testimony is. My t uh, I'll be very clear. We have, we have told them, we've been engaged in a uh, long conversation with them about the most effective way to deal with the problem we agree must be dealt with. They that are quite Hamas aware you disagree with their plan to kill the Hamas terrorists because That's you and the president have vocally said it. And to be clear, wrong. your State Department on the morning of October 7th sent out a tweet telling Israel not to engage in military re retaliation. I called you out at 3 in the morning and you deleted that tweet. The next day, you personally on October 8th sent a tweet saying you had spoken with the Turkish foreign minister and Israel should not retaliate. From the very beginning, the Biden administration has consistently at every stage told Israel, and by the way, when I called your tweet out, you deleted it again. At every stage, you have been telling Israel, do not kill the terrorists, and that has been from day one. Senator, I was in Israel five days after October 7th. I've been there seven times since. No one, starting with President Biden, has done more to make sure they have what they need to defend themselves from Hamas to deal with the threat well, that Hamas yeah, poses. With all due sure respect, that, that, no, that, 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 is, that is wrong. ludicrous. That, that, that is ludicrous. Why, did, why have you cut off weapons to Israel then? We have not cut off weapons to Israel. In fact, we, as you know well, uh, starting many years ago, uh, President Biden was at the heart of the MOU that led to Israel having a 10-year guaranteed supply of assistance. When, it, uh, which when, you became very Secretary of when you became Secretary of State, how much oil was Iran selling a day? I'll have to come back to you on any numbers. I don't have the, uh, the numbers. You don't know. It doesn't surprise me you don't know. It was about 300,000. How much oil is Iran selling today? We have, we have, we've applied sanctions against more How than much 200 oil is entities Iran selling that are engaged today? in petrochemicals. How much oil? oil okay, you can tell me. I'm sure don't you, I'm filibuster. Sure you know. I'm not filibustering. How much oil me. are they selling today? Do you, you tell know? me. You tell me. Uh, apparently, you don't know. So you don't know how much they were selling. It was 300,000. Today, they're selling about 2 million barrels a day. Let me ask you. And the, given the sanctions, given the export controls, given the other controls we put on, the cost of doing that, uh, the evasion that they have to engage in, which we're trying to cut They've off, made about $80 billion. Is, Let me ask you another question. I'm running out of time, so I'm, I'm not interested in speeches. Let me ask you this. How many ghost fleet ships did Iran have in November 2020? We uh, have sanctioned more than 200 It's a question. I'm, I'm not, how many did we've, they have? Um, the total number, I can't tell you what it had in 2021. I'll come back to you with that, but we have... Uh, the number was about 70. Yeah, how we, many did they have today? About, we blocked about 50 of them. Okay, let's see how effective you are. How many do they have today? As I said, we blocked about 50 How of many them. do they have today? You, you, you tell me, I'm sure you... They have about over 400. Mm -hmm. Look, this administration desperately wants a new Iran deal. You, you have been showering cash on Iran from day one. And understand, the $6 billion you were asked about is the tip of the iceberg. By refusing to enforce oil sanctions, we have seen Iran's oil sales go from 300,000 barrels a day when you got into office to over 2 million barrels a day to today. That's $80 billion. 90% of Hamas's funding comes from Iran in a very real sense. This administration, you and President Biden, funded the October 7th attacks by flowing $100 billion to a homicidal, genocidal regime that funded those attacks. That statement is profoundly wrong. Why? I'm not even going to uh, humor it. I think it's a disgraceful statement. Uh, why? We have gone at Iran repeatedly with more than 600 sanctions applied against different persons. Then why are they entities? selling 2 million 200? barrels a day as compared to 300,000? They are working hard to do what they can to get around the sanctions. So just it the prior administration cost, was, was had cost, tools you didn't the have, they were doing, more effective, the cost of doing or maybe they just weren't desperate to cut a deal with Iran. And we continue every single day uh, to go at them. You are it's refusing very, to address the facts. I'm not. Then why are they selling 2 million barrels a day? Because they're determined to try to do that. We're determined to cut them off. They weren't determined when Trump was president? Uh, they, were, they, they were determined. And of course, unfortunately, uh, we also had their nuclear program in a box. No fissile material being produced. Okay, you're not answering the question. You're filibustering another topic. I'm not, I'm not Cruz, you get the last word. You get the last word. Go ahead. You funded our enemies and you undermine our friends, and the world 
is much, much more dangerous as a result, and Americans are at greater jeopardy because of it. Okay.